we're starting a conversation series around decolonization. And the idea is that we want to kickstart this event tonight by having a speaker, by having a panel, and by opening up the conversation around decolonialization and decoloniality. And really for, for us to engage with somebody that is an expert in his field and to, to think about the, the kinds of ideas that he puts on the table and, and to begin to reflect around what it means when we say decolonize science, decolonize math. And whether we agree with it or not, that's not really, the, the point is that it opens up the scope for, for conversation. Science is not something permanent. Science is constantly changing, so you have to change. Why is there so much resistance to this kind of change? So it is not knowledge as it exists. If it were, why be afraid to expose it to criticism? Let me just take the central point that I'm making, which I will try to explain. How do you decolonize science? Right? You have this idea that science is universal and, you know, how can you go about decolonizing it? It's all decided and, you know, the, all these authorities are sitting there and telling you there's only one way to do science. Anybody tells you anything on the basis of authority, reject it. Science is empirical. <coughs> all right, that's a very straightforward thing. It's empirical, it's experimental, it does not depend on authority, it does not depend on publications, it does not depend on nature and so on. Prof Raju was one of scholars who presented at the UNISA Summer School on Decoloniality. And uh, he was amongst a number of decolonial scholars, some of them well known, um, Ramon Grosfrugo being one, and the other one uh, being Nelson Maldonado Torres, whom we've invited as well uh, to UCT last year. And there were also South African uh, scholars uh, speaking at the summer school, um, Tendai, Sitole, uh, Prof Zondi from Pretoria, Prof Gola from VET. But amongst those uh, who presented, Prof Raju was the only um, decolonial scholar who spoke specifically on decolonizing science. And he was very well received by a diverse audience, uh, including students and, and faculty from different universities. The main message I would give to them is that colonial education teaches two things. One is to not trust your common sense. And I think if students do that, if they are allowed to do that, then there will be a fundamental change because you don't allow the student to question the teacher fundamentally. You don't allow him to question the syllabus that is being taught. And you should allow that sort of freedom. And I think the students here have taken a very bold step. So I would like to congratulate them. Following the student protests of 2015, um, there was a need to establish a task team, if you like, or a working group that would look specifically at some of the issues that students had raised in relation to curriculum. And these were about the decolonization of curriculum, uh, conventional teaching practices, and whether these served students uh, in terms of how um, they belong to the classrooms, whether they felt alienated or marginalized, um, other issues around symbols and symbolism and representativity. So it was important that when the group was constituted, that it was um, mainly black academics who have had track records of working in curriculum change in their own fields, in their own departments, and that they brought a sense of legitimacy and relevance to the questions now being posed by students. The attempt to decolonize what we study and teach, it seems to me, will encounter very different challenges as we move from one discipline to another. For those disciplines which explicitly see themselves as in the business of cultural expression, decolonizing path or paths may be more or less hard to find, but the need to take steps is blatant because proper cultural expression demands an authenticity which refuses simply to ape alien modalities. No doubt all disciplines are in some measure redolent of their cultural settings, but unlike those which aim explicitly at cultural expression, others have different goals, and truth surely is primary among them. A cultural setting may influence a discipline's move towards truth, either by distorting that movement, erecting barriers and diversions, or by influencing which of many possible truths it chooses to take an interest in. The first set of influences is obviously pernicious. 
The latter need not be at all detrimental, but rather might help the gui to guide the discipline towards relevance. Both kinds of influence throw um, sorry, both kinds of influence throw up avenues for decolonization of those disciplines aiming at truth. For colonizing aspects of culture might frustrate practitioners in their um, pursuit of truth. And indeed, this is one of Professor Raju's complaints against Western science. I'll return to this in a moment. And the interests of practitioners in a science whose goals are imperialist or which serve imperialist agendas are likely to be very different from those in a society which rejects and replaces those goals. Relevance in a distinctively cultural sense may be more or less of an, imp of an imperative depending on um, how much it looks beyond itself for direction. Pure mathematics, I think, throws up particular problems for the decolonial enterprise because it aims at truth, it doesn't explicitly aim to be a form of cultural expression, and because it pretends not to look beyond disciplinary boundaries in determining its own direction. Professor Raju's decolonial agenda for mathematics is, it often seems to me, a rejection of pure mathematics. So in some measure, I'll be aiming to defend pure mathematics as an enterprise in the pursuit of truth, which ought to be important to all societies. The paradox is that science needs math. And what is the math we use today is formal math, which is anti-empirical. So it is a paradox that you use something anti-empirical and claim it is universal. And you apply it to science. That is the uh, idiosyncrasy of Western mathematics, of Western mathematics in the 20th century of uh, total myth, a falsehood about Euclid and so on, which has been uh, perpetrated for, well, perpetuated for so long, I think we need to get rid of it. I also think that when it comes to trying to think of a new way of doing mathematics, it's not that helpful to speculate on the reality of an historical person like Euclid. Anybody who knows almost anything about the history of mathematics knows that there is nothing known about Euclid, that there is an ascription of an individual who wrote the books called The Elements of Euclid, but actually this is not well attested. We, we don't know who that individual was or wasn't. My submission would be that the academics, if they're teaching, they should be able to publicly justify what they teach. They can't teach it saying, oh, this community does it, or that university does it in the West. So can they publicly justify what they are teaching and what is its value for the society immediately around them, for the people immediately around them? In terms of mathematics, Professor Raju says that formal mathematics is anti-empirical. The comparison I want to make is with your cell phone. When you talk on your cell phone, when you send a message on your cell phone, there are lots of steps, from cell phone to the nearest cell phone tower, and many steps along the way. This is exactly like broken telephone. The message gets sent from one to the other. But unlike broken telephone, it comes out correct. Why? The answer is formal mathematics. We would not have the supercomputer that Professor Raju mentioned that he worked on if we did not have formal mathematics. The whole project of formalizing mathematics resulted in the design of computers. People like Alan Turing and John von Neumann, who were central to the early stages of making computers, were able to do that because of their mastery of the formalisms of formal logic. My argument that I want to make is to say um, that whilst I agree that looking at the content, as Professor Raju argues, is crucially important, but we don't actually look at the approach of curriculum, and curriculum itself um, as an approach is not decolonized, then I think that that could be dangerous. In the field of curriculum studies, um, this notion of Tyler and this linear notion of curriculum, um, I mean, has been challenged and dismissed um, at least since 1969. But that has not actually moved um, into the way in which curriculum is practiced in schools and 
in universities, with, with, with certain exceptions, of course. I'm talking about what is dominant. In order for the people in this country to get full access to the power of mathematics, we need to do things that really empower people at schools, that really empower people, the teachers, that really develop the teachers. And a lot of that has very little to do with the history of mathematics or with the philosophy of mathematics. It has to do with giving teachers enough time to change, giving them support, allowing teachers to get out of the classroom so that they can do courses and then go back in giving them promotion if they actually really do develop themselves, getting the schools that were under apartheid were told that they were not to teach mathematics, changing that culture around. We still find that the vast majority of the mathematics students at UCT come from the same schools that produced them under apartheid. We don't have to deal with the consequences of the theft of mathematics that happened 500 years ago. We have to deal with the consequences of Hendrik Verwurt. We have to deal with the consequences of Andri Strjernicht. Those are much more recent. They're much more immediate. Science cannot be free of culture because it has to be culturally produced. Um, and it cannot be free of social relations. So there's always going to be human interest um, when it comes um, um, to science. And even, I want to ask that question to Prof. Raju, so even if we argue for a narrow empiricism or a pure um, empiricism, is that not in a sense uh, a metaphysical um, claim or, or statement? So the other point I want to make, if we argue for the kind of empiricism of what Professor Raju um, argues for, is there space, which is a particular interest of mine um, in a lot of my work, um, for legitimating indigenous knowledge? Um, and where does the, this conversation about indigenous knowledge and, and the way in, it, in which it must be le le legitimated and dominant um, science be decentered, not destroyed, so that there are new spaces, which are third spaces or interstitial spaces, for productive conversation to happen. Where's the space for that, which is very crucial in our discussions in, in the South African context? Certainly we can see that the context shows and the history shows there has been a particular way of looking at curriculum. And in the last two years, we've applied ourselves to asking different questions looking at different issues that are directly related to some of the, the deeper systemic issues in the national context. I hope that in many ways that, that the event tonight, which focuses on decolonizing science, will come from a, from a perspective that will challenge us and, and challenge scientists and, and mathematicians at UCT to think differently about this subject area when like I said you don't you don't have to agree but just to, to, to have a different viewpoint and that that could be a starting point to start reflecting on how do I engage with my own curriculum and to start having the conversation with students around how do I engage with my own con my own curriculum and and to begin to think about co-creating a curriculum that can take on board some of the thoughts around decolonial decoloniality it's not going to be a short conversation either. It's going to be a long process. But I think we, we can no longer avoid the process. We need to delve in and we need to start that process.